so we are looking at certain first order proofs and so on that today we will uh, so we will look at uh, um, existential quantification today. So, we will go through existential quantification today. There is something special about existential quantification even though it is uh, uh, it is a derived operator of uh, the Helbert style system. So, uh, so in fact uh, I am going to devote the entire lecture to just existential quantification. Uh, so, what is this what is special about it and uh, this is something that is ignored by all mathematicians and computer scientists and everybody they just take it for granted, but there are cer certain deep and subtle issues uh, in existential quantification which need to be taken care of in any minimal axiomatization of predicate calculus and therefore, by extension for any first order theory right. Where existential quantification plays a fairly important role. Uh, but before that uh, uh, let us look at uh, okay. So, I, I have a I have a couple of exercises here to which I will also add some more exercises uh, and I will put up the slides only after I added those exercises yeah. Um, so, um, so, but uh, so, uh, let us just look at this uh, exercise essentially. Uh, it has to do uh, so all our uh, uh, all our uh, quantified formulae uh, are somehow deeply concerned with the existence or non existence of pre variables that is. Uh, so, uh, there are certain things that you can prove uh, if you know that there is uh, a free variable does not exist in a formula right. And uh, so, there, there are some certain surprising things that happen. Uh, so, let us let us assume uh, phi and psi are formulae. I know you may not be able to see it, uh, but in particular what happens is so, uh, we will take uh, the existential quantifier as uh, I mean there exists phi as an abbreviation for not of for all x not phi yeah, uh, by the standard de Morgan uh, extension um, right. So, now let us assume that uh, there is a variable x which is not a free variable of phi right. Uh, okay. So, and th 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 this this quantification for all x is deliberate it is it is es essentially got to do with that variable x yeah. So, x does not occur anywhere inside the body of phi as a free variable. So, effectively uh, quantification does nothing to the truth or the validity of the formula phi right. So, for all x phi and phi uh, will have the same truth values and therefore, the same validity uh, whenever uh, 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 so, so, so under any interpretation. In particular what happens in uh, in, uh, in the proof system is that uh, you can take, so you can take, uh, so for example, so therefore, phi uh, actually implies logically implies for all x phi and uh, uh, by the universal in instantiation by for all uh, by for all elimination uh, you also get that uh, for all x phi will logically imply phi if x is not a free variable of phi. Uh, so, which means that uh, phi and for all x phi are logically equivalent and uh, so this exercise is to just sh is, is, is to show that uh, you have to sort of prove these things within the Hilbert uh, system H 1. Um, the other thing is uh, so this happens uh, in this case. So, it, and, and in fact the same thing happens to uh, the existential quantifier also. So, there exists x phi implies phi and uh, we are going to do this rule uh, there exists uh, introduction uh, which will show that uh, there exists x uh, phi is logically equivalent to is uh, is, is equal uh, is logically equivalent to phi right. And um, the interesting thing is now psi could have x as a free variable right. Uh, so, now when you look at phi arrow psi and look at its universal quantification uh, that turns out so since uh, x does nothing at all to phi. Uh, so, therefore, this is logically equivalent to phi arrow for all x psi. So, the uh, the for all quantifier can be moved in 
to and and localized to psi right but the more interesting thing is this supposing x is a free variable of psi but x is not a free variable of phi then when you have for all x psi arrow phi then that is logically equivalent to saying that if there does exist an x for which psi is true uh, then phi must also be true. So, there is there is an inversion of quantifier which happens in this last portion yeah? that uh, so that is an important uh, important thing. So, that inversion does not take place here uh, this is important also for other reasons which uh, which will become clear when we do uh, normal forms and so on and so forth. But, uh, but for the present uh, for the purpose of this today's lecture actually it is important to just notice this d portion. Yeah. Okay. So, let us start uh, today's lecture. So, the point is that the standard thing in any computer science or logic textbook is to use uh, what if, in all our derived rules for Hilbert systems. Uh, when we introduced new operators, we bas basically had introduction and elimination rules for those operators, right? Uh, and that is that is a trend you can continue uh, for this derived operator. There exists x, so there exists x phi is just defined as not of for all x, not phi, and then we can have these two rules. This is there exists introduction, which says that if I if phi is of the form such that uh, it looks like t has been substituted for a free variable x in phi. If that is the form it adopts, then I can take phi in its original form and uh, existentially quantify it. Okay. There is a slight difference between the for all rule for all introduction and there exists introduction there there was an implicit notion of an arbitrary variable y okay and arbitrary is only what we spoke we did not actually implement it in any way here if t were a variable then basically you can think of it as a particular variable rather than an arbitrary variable okay our interpretations of logic are always over uh, non empty domains. So, if there does exist any valuation at all which makes t for x phi true, then you can confidently assert that there does exist an x which makes phi true, right. And that is so, if there is even one, so not all t's and not all terms t, nor, nor all variables may be substituted for x, but if there is even one that can be substituted and uh, for x in phi and uh, phi can be made true according to our interpretation, then we can confidently assert that there does exist x which will make phi true. Right? So, there is a, so it looks suspiciously similar to the for all introduction, but is different okay? and that difference has to be somehow captured and we are going to spend essentially the rest of this lecture capturing that difference. But more importantly you take the elimination rule there exists elimination and here you are essentially making the distinction between arbitrary and particular. Okay? So, I am going to I am going to make make this distinction uh, by by essentially uh, referring to it as uh, what we what we do in normal mathematics uh, between the distinction between a variable and a constant. Okay. A variable can basically take any value a constant is a particular value and it is therefore, fixed in a certain sense. Yeah. So, this red a is supposed to is supposed to signify a constant. Okay. And uh, but the thing is that our language did not have any entity called a constant, and it does not have it. I mean, we are we are talking of a purely syntactic formalization. Uh, so, which means we just have a collection of variables 
but somehow we have to capture the idea that this a is a particular constant right and um, so if a just happens to be some element in the set of variables uh, it should uh, satisfy this condition of being fresh so these this is what makes it particular there is an issue of freshness also which comes in which we have to somehow capture and of course by fresh essentially what i'm say uh, what i'm saying this will may will be made clearer uh, a little later but the basic minimum condition that you require of this a is that it should not be a free variable of any of the assumptions gamma and it should not be a free variable of there exists x phi okay this is the basic minimum condition the other extra condition is that it should be fresh right we'll look at that so the third important thing about these two introduction and elimination rules is that whereas there exists i is a derived rule there exists e cannot be derived in the hilbert system okay whereas there exists e is something that you you always naturally in any mathematical proof you actually whenever you have an existential statement and you have to start proving from that you immediately put in a symbol for a constant a and you proceed with the proof which means the first question is if this if this there exists e cannot be derived then in the hilbert system then is the hilbert system incomplete for one thing secondly uh, how can we justify proofs in mathematics where we automatically put in a constant symbol a and say okay let this be the thing with this property yeah so so we'll look at this but first uh, let's just look at this this uh, there exists introduction is a derived rule and uh, here again because the the our trees are like i don't know my trees are like banyan trees i think so they are uh, they are too vast and too wide and they they go beyond that uh, text width of this uh, screen um, but for those of you who have binoculars and so on and so forth maybe you can use them uh, so essentially what we are saying is that uh, so okay so uh, the proof actually requires uh, the fact that t for x is admissible in phi right um and the uh, so assume t for x is admissible in phi uh, then uh, i can take uh, for all x not phi uh, arrow not of t for x phi yeah uh, and then i can also use this uh, n double prime rule n double which which is familiar to all of you it's a contrapositive rule uh, which you all used in your uh, examination so which essentially says that uh, so in this particular instance it would say that for all x not phi arrow not of t x t for x phi imp, uh, essentially implies that i can put a double negation on the right hand side of the arrow make that the left hand side and put a negation on the left hand side of the arrow and make it the right hand side so that's what this is so i have not of t for x phi here so that becomes not not t for x phi and i have for all x not phi here and that becomes not for all x not phi so this is a contrapositive rule a derived rule which was there in one of the exercises yeah so this is n double prime so and of course um, from from this and this by modus ponens i can essentially remove this so i get double negation uh, not not of t for x phi arrow not of for all x not phi uh and there is this double negation introduction which says that t for x phi uh arrow not not t for x phi and between these two i can use transitivity to get that t for x phi arrow not of for all x not phi not of for all x not phi is just uh, you know, there exists x phi right uh, so so, uh, so 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 you get this uh, so this is a derived rule right now um, let's let's go further so now let's look at existential elimination because that's a problem it's not something that can be derived in the hilbert style system 
But the interesting thing about uh, proof systems is that it is quite possible as I said to get a different set of proof rules which are not necessarily derivable from another set. So, you can have two, two independent sets of proof rules which are both sound and complete. Okay. Uh, and in fact, that is the attitude most, uh, uh, most logicians would take when it comes to the natural deduction system versus the Hilbert style system. They would not derive the natural deduction system from the Hilbert style system. They will look at them as regard them as two independent proof systems. In the case of propositional logic what we did was we actually derived every rule of the natural deduction system from the Hilbert style system. right? Uh, and, we, and we have been doing that except for this there exists elimination. Yeah, except for existential elimination. So now, what we'll do is let's let's look at a let's look at a standard proof of uh, such a statement, right? Uh, this is something that should be true in any predicate calculus. Yeah, if there exists an x such that phi arrow psi, and for all x phi, from that it should be possible to prove uh, that there exists x psi, and this proof should be possible. Precisely, and all these proofs rely on the fact that you are uh, in any semantics of first order logic, you have a non empty domain. So, that this statements like for all x phi do not become vacuously true. So, it is possible to in instantiate for all x phi uh, and find a term such that t for x phi would hold true, right. Okay. So, now the standard practice in mathematics and in fact in any natural deduction proof system would be to uh, assume the existence of some constant symbol a and then uh, proceed with it to sort of generalize. So, what so, so as in the case of uh, universal um, quantifier, we would do the same thing in the case of existential quantifier too. Any proof in the case of a universal quantifier which first instantiated by using for all elimination, get some term, proceed with the proof and then generalize again back to a for all. Right? In the case of existential, uh, in the case of exist existential quantifier also we do essentially the same thing. So, here is a proof. Uh, okay. uh, so, I am so, here is a proof where I am assuming there exists elimination. So, even if you cannot read it, uh, the red color should guide you to what I am saying. Yeah. So, uh, the uh, so the red color is bright enough, right? Okay. Uh, actually, I can read this from here. I do not know whether you can read it from there. But uh, so, essentially, what we are saying is I take this there exists x phi arrow psi and I eliminate the existential quantifier by having a new constant a for x right uh, phi or phi arrow psi and of course uh, this a for x phi arrow psi is purely syntactic right i mean it's a substitution is a syntactic operation and so it is syntactically equal, equal to just this one a for x phi arrow a for x psi so that i mean that doesn't require a proof rule because it's just syntax yeah uh, and this this is a meta syntactic uh, equal e, uh, equivalence right i mean okay so essentially think of it as a for x phi arrow a for x psi that's what you're getting and uh, this for all x phi i'm actually going to ins instantiate it with the same a if i don't instantiate it with the same a then i cannot apply modus ponens because now the propositions are different this this pattern is would be different from this pattern. The only way modus ponens can be applied is if this pattern is identical to this pattern. Yeah. Okay. So then, with modus ponens, I essentially get a for x psi, uh, which I now introduce the existential quantifier, and therefore I get there exists x psi. The most interesting thing about this is this is how this is essentially a proof tree of a standard mathematical proof of and given some existential assumption and some universal assumption you prove an existential uh, statement 
and uh, in the process of proving that you actually instantiate the existential statement use that same constant to instantiate the universal statement proceed with the proof till you get the right form and then existentially generalize that is that is a standard practice right. Okay. So, uh, so, but it turns out that I do not need to go through this. Yeah. If I stuck to my Hilbert system and only whatever rules can be derived from it, then I do not need to go through this, uh, because what I am going to do is I am going to do something that looks suspiciously like a proof by contradiction, but actually is not a proof by contradiction in that propositional sense. Right. So, what I am going to do is I am going to assume essentially the negation of this. Uh, and the negation of this uh, there exists x psi is actually is really for all x not psi. I am going to take this assumption and then I am going to discharge it somewhere. Right. So, now what I have in my assumptions are all universally quantified statements and so now I do not need to use any existential quantifier. Uh, and the proof goes as follows. So, let uh, I am taking my assumptions delta to be for all x phi and for all x not psi. Okay, uh, so, for all x phi of course, uh, is uh, can be instantiated to phi, because in particular I can instantiate, I do not need to actually substitute a term for x for the free occurrences of x and phi, I can leave it as it is. Yeah. Okay. And uh, for all x not psi can also be instantiated to not psi. Uh, so, now x might be a free variable in both phi and not psi. Right. Okay. Uh, the other thing is that uh, we had a derived rule, right. So, since all our propositional uh, int, uh, rules were derived rules from the Hilbert system, I can apply one of them. For example, I can apply and introduction. If I apply and introduction, essentially I can take phi and not psi, but of course, my language I am restricting it and is a derived operator and it is essentially defined as not of phi or of psi. So, from these two essentially by and introduction and using the fact that and is defined this, uh, this way as phi and not psi is defined as not of phi or of psi, I get not of phi or of psi. And, uh, now, this x here throughout oh, is arbitrary, I mean this there is no particular reason to worry about x. So, which means I can uh, apply my universal generalization. So, I can introduce the universal quantifier and essentially from delta I can prove for all x not of phi arrow psi and uh, then uh, these are all closed formulae. So, the deduction theorem is applicable. So, I can move this assumption for all x not psi to the right hand side and I get for all x not psi arrow for all x not of phi arrow psi and uh, then I apply n prime. Uh, n prime is very much like n double prime, uh, but when I apply, uh, so n prime essentially says for all x not psi arrow for all x not of phi arrow psi arrow uh, negation of this arrow negation of this yeah and that's what it is and uh, applying this and uh, again here again because i had to split the trees uh, split the tree cut it into bits so that uh, it fits into this uh, screen um, so essentially applying n prime and then uh, modus ponens on this uh, i get uh, for not of for all x not of phi or arrow psi, arrow not of for all x not psi. Um, this now I can move this to the left side, they are all closed formulas that they are essentially like propositions, all the conditions of and this is uh, the inverse of the deduction theorem and that has no conditions, whether it is propositional or predicate logic it does not matter, I can always apply it. So, I can move this formula to the left. So, what I get now is for all x phi and this formula not of for all x not of phi or psi is actually there exists x phi or psi which was the original assumption 
which we were supposed to prove, uh, which we were supposed to use. And this right hand side not of for all x not psi is just there exists x psi, right. So, essentially without using existential elimination, I have you can prove you can prove this uh, you can prove any uh, any statement actually right but the problem is that it is not clear how to translate proofs using existential quantifiers existential in, uh, how to translate proofs using existential elimination to proofs which do not use existential elimination i mean there is no direct translation so which which means that uh, you have to you have to do some more work to prove that your Hilbert's uh, firstly that your Hilbert system is complete, secondly that for if if there is a proof using existential elimination, then there exists a proof which does not use existential elimination. So I have to prove both of them, right? Uh, so that's what we are going to do. Okay. So let's look at existential elimination. Okay, so firstly, of course, it's not a derived rule, and what we are going to do is proofs which it, uh, which use existential elimination. I'll subscript them with a. If anywhere in the proof there is an occurrence of existential elimination, then I'll say that I have proved it using this. So the whole proof uh, gets uh, bloodied with this uh, with this red mark, yeah, on the provability symbol. So. And then further this was actually a simple proof, but there are some restrictions on the use of uh, existential elimination in proofs. And actually those restrictions are intuitively clear uh, uh, when most of us do our proofs using existential statements, uh, but however we should actually formalize them and that is one thing. Um, but the interesting thing is that as you can see that this this proof using existential elimination is very short very intuitive compared to this proof which does not use existential elimination yeah okay so 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 that's why it's it's easy to use existential elimination and we should uh, and therefore uh, and therefore you get uh, if you can prove that for a, every proof which uses existential elimination there is also a corresponding proof which does not use it then we are essentially safe and this we need to do this especially because this is not a derived rule. There is no derivation uh, of the rule and there is no direct translation of the proof. I mean <coughs> for example, uh, translation of proofs is something that uh, we have used. I do not know whether you have done it uh, in one of your courses, but if you look at the principle of mathematical induction uh, and the principle of complete induction. Right. You take proofs by principle of mathematical induction and proofs by complete induction. So what do you do? There is actually a direct verbal translation of any. So you can you can take that actual the actual language sentences in the proof of in the proof by prin the principle of mathematical induction, and by just changing the property, you can get an exact syntactically identical proof except for the fact that it will be using the principle of complete induction. The induction hypothesis naturally changes, right. You can do direct translations of proofs. So, if you take uh, similarly, if you take proofs by um, a structural induction. So, uh, uh, one of the things that you might want to do is you uh, for example, the principle of structural induction uh, gives us a convenience of case analysis uh, and uh, using the structure but really it is no more powerful than the than a proof by mathematical induction right so it's possible so the proof that it is no more powerful than the principle of mathematical induction rather the proof the meta proof that for every proof by structural induction there is also a proof by mathematical induction take that meta proof can be translated from structural induction directly into mathematical induction by just making certain syntactic transformations in this case, however, there are no such syntactic transformations. So, many of these 
prove so so we have we have we have a twofold problem really firstly the rule is not a derived rule secondly the proofs are not translatable as this shows right i mean uh, I'm, i mean for, for the present we'll assume that this is the only proof that is available right further there are certain restrictions which we implicitly follow so i'll call this informally i'll call the proof by using their exists elimination to be correct provided and these are the these are discipline that we have to follow and in fact we implicitly follow it in any mathematical proof firstly each application of existential elimination should use a fresh constant symbol right so for example if i had if i had uh, uh, if i had a if i had formulae with uh, let's say two existential quantifiers okay then i would have to use new constants for each instantiation right this because the semantics says that whatever constant i use to instant, instantiate x in phi may not be the same constant for y so i have to use two different constants so i might actually get there exists y a for x phi and then if i want to instantiate it once more then i have to assume that there exists some other b for y a for x phi so i have each time i use existential elimination i have to use a new symbol and moreover this this symbol these two symbols a and b actually should not have occurred anywhere in the proof let's assume that this is some intermediate statement in the proof then what we are saying is there is there is some proof from which you concluded this any of the symbols that were there in the proof should be different from this a and this b otherwise you are likely to have a fallacious proof right and this is a discipline we actually implicitly follow when we do these proofs right so that's so so the meaning of fresh is just that that you have to pull out a completely new symbol which does not exist anywhere in the proof so that's why i'm saying that this uh, uh is is any of these a link uh, none of these is a link okay um so so that's why i'm saying that this a does not belong to free variables of gamma union free variables of there exists x phi is not sufficient what you want to do is given gamma and a whole proof you have to look at the entire proof to make sure a does not occur anywhere there when you are using a as a constant of existential elimination so it's not just a question of being syntactic about the assumptions and the the formula here you have to look at whatever preceded it in every step there you should make sure that that you are choosing an a which is really fresh which does not occur anywhere there okay so that is that is of course one restriction and uh, there is another thing one thing is that a and b are essentially terms right so there is a if a and b are just terms or variables then there is a tendency to actually universally generalize okay so one thing is you cannot universally generalize on this a and b in that sense they are special in that so that's why i'm calling them constants right okay that's one thing the second thing is that supposing there is some free variable here supposing y has uh, supposing phi has some z which is a free variable yeah the truth of z and with a and b may not allow you to directly 
do a universal quantification over z for example. Okay. So, universal quantifications may have to be postponed till you have done an existential quantification and there is still that free variable. Otherwise, they are like you might have you might end up with uh, a fallacious proof, but not just that, not just a z that occurs in this. Any free variable z which occurs in uh, so okay, here is the exact thing. So, firstly, for all z a for x phi cannot be deduced for any variable z which belongs to the free variables of there exists y psi intersection. So, so you supposing so so essentially what we are saying is supposing you have a proof, you have some large proof. At some place there was a there exists psi and z was a free variable of psi let us say and you applied uh, existential elimination and you got let us say a for x psi. Okay. You go down some, some steps, okay. we, you know that you cannot universally generalize on z here, but maybe you go down some few steps something happens and you are left with some a for x some chi which is derived from this and then you decide to generalize on z. This is also not allowed, right. So, what you are saying is you go through that entire proof wherever there was wherever you use. So, what is the idea of a proof system? The idea of a proof system is to preserve truth. The fact that this is true in your proof might depend entirely on the existence of A. Okay? It may not it may not be independent of the existence of A. So, which means that so, therefore, for different constants a and a prime the corresponding x which makes this formula true chi, uh, which makes this formula chi true might be different. So, for different a and a prime you might require different values b and b prime for x to make it true in which case you cannot universally generalize on this z. I am sorry I reword it I should reword it. So, the z which makes this chi true here might vary with the constant a. So, for different constants a you might have different values of z. So, therefore, you cannot universally quantify on z. So, which means that you have to go through the entire proof and look at all those steps which you involve constants, look at all those free variables, make sure you do not generalize on those, you do not do a universal generalization on those free variables till you have eliminated the constant. You might eliminate the constant in one of two ways. One is that that constant might just disappear as part of something. For example, if you use and elimination, the constant might be on one term, but may not be in the on the other, and you may have eliminated. In which case, then after that, you don't have that constant occurring anywhere, and you could actually generalize. The other way is that you might take the fact that that constant is there, you might existentially generalize, therefore eliminate that constant, and then universally generalize and that way preserve truth right so these are the now these are the subtle issues which make any mathematical proof uh, which make the debugging of a mathematical proof very hard how are what is the structure of the proof are they using existential elimination in some way are they generalizing before eliminating the constant right and uh, so so this restriction is actually very important if a constant symbol a earlier introduced by an application of existential elimination to a formula there exists y psi appears in a formula a for x phi in a proof then 
for all z a for x phi cannot be deduced for any variable z which is free in there exists y psi intersection free variables of a for x phi by applying the universal instantiation right. So, buggy proofs come because, because this step 2 is somehow violated. A large number of buggy proofs actually happen because of this. They also may, may many bugs in mathematical proofs and which are very hard to detect also happen because sometimes uh, it also happen because of the fact that the universal generalization precedes the existential generalization. So, so what I mean is there exists x for all by phi is not logically equivalent to for all y there exists x phi because semantically they have different interpretations. So, before so if you if your proof did have an instance of existential elimination then you cannot do the universal quantification before you have eliminated that constant. So, in which case most of the time you are looking at this. and not this and this is this is typical uh, this, this is something that this these two formulae like are like um, a typical example is that of in in any algebraic system the existence of identity and inverse these two formulae actually are like weak versions of that right. Uh, in the first case you are saying that essentially there exists an identity element. Uh, I mean I can write phi in terms of x and y such that x is essentially an identity element for some operation. In this case I am really talking about inverses. So, for every y there might there is a different x for every y there is an x, but for every y there is a different x for different y's there might be different x's. And so, the, the semantical interpretations of these two formulae are different and in a proof you have to be ensure you have to ensure that you preserve the truth of that. So, this so, so this actually affects the entire proof otherwise you will confuse inverses with identities ok. Um, a formula a for x phi where a is a constant symbol and x belongs to the free variables of phi that is another thing you, you can you should only generalize it to uh, when you when you eliminate that uh, constant by generalization you have to generalize only existentially you cannot generalize universally right. So, that is but the the most treacherous thing is this point two. Okay, so so now we'll say correct. We'll say a proof with existential elimination is correct if it actually satisfies this these three conditions. Um, now here's the theorem which I've called existential elimination elimination theorem. This is my own name, um, but but I think it is self explanatory yeah. All I am saying now is that if there is a correct proof of phi from assumptions gamma which uses existential elimination then there is a proof which does not use existential elimination uh, and uh, which such that uh, phi can be proved from gamma yeah. Um, So, the the one condition that I need here is that this phi should not use any of the constants that were introduced in existential elimination otherwise I will never be able to prove this ok. Typically what we are saying is so uh, typically what we are saying is that phi should be uh, should either be a conclusion which is already existentially uh, uh, in which uh, a, a, a the existential quantifier has been introduced for each of the constants or those constants have been eliminated by some other means, but phi should not contain any of those constants that were introduced in this proof. So, you take so this is a proof that is given to you what your and phi has been given such that it does not contain any of these constants. Notice that if phi does contain any of those constants then it is not a statement that is uh, provable without the introduction of the constant 
right? So that's that's obvious. So we'll look at only those statements phi uh, which do not uh, have any of the constants that were introduced in this uh, in this proof, right? So that's uh, so that's this last portion. Yeah. So so this theorem is not applicable if phi does not contain any of the constants introduced by the proof of this. Phi does contain, yeah. Okay. So let's look at this proof. And it's so supposing there is a correct proof of phi from gamma, and uh, let's say that correct proof involves. Uh, by the way, there is a small error here which I have to correct, which I thought of only later. Uh, but when we come to that, I'll talk about it. So, if you introduced existential elimination, uh, then somewhere in the proof not necessarily in the assumptions gamma, but somewhere in the proof you had this existential formulae which were instantiated. Okay. Now, what I am saying is so if you if these were if these were existentially if these existential quantifiers were eliminated then of course, the freshness condition says that for each of these formulae you should have chosen a fresh new constant. So, let us assume we chose corresponding constants a 1 to a k. So, wherever okay, there is something here which okay. uh, now this statement clearly each of these applications of there exists E is to a leaf node of the proof tree uh, by the way, this statement is wrong. Yeah this statement is wrong. All I am saying is now what we do is I look at a fresh proof. I have already introduced these constants a 1 to a k. I put this corresponding instantiated versions of these psi 1 to psi k as extra assumptions in addition to gamma. Okay. So, take a proof tree. So, this proof tree unfortunately, I do not have a red pen here. So, we have this proof tree which somehow we have some huge proof tree in which which is rooted essentially at gamma proves phi right. And at various stages either from gamma itself or at, at various intermediate stages there are applications of existential elimination yeah and which gave us these constants a 1 to a k right? yeah now what i'm saying is take this proof tree and i'm going to construct another proof tree okay where the assumptions are gamma i'm going to write this i'm going to write this simply in red now huh, to say that i I've, I've used this a1 for x y1 and a2 for y2 and so on okay and essentially from this i i have proved let's say phi and of course uh, none of these constants a1 to ak occurs in phi now this proof tree is such that I take this proof tree and retain only this step. I, 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 so this, so there was a subtree here maybe, but it ended in this step, right? So I throw out this subtree entirely because now I retain only this because now this has become part of my assumptions. Okay, so. I throw out all these subtrees which gave me this constants and retain only the step with the constants, right. In each of these steps here there was gamma, but now what I am going to have, so I am going to have a sort of a pruned tree with leaves like this 
uh, where there are these there are these first steps are some the occurrences of this a 1, a 3, a 4 let us say and what is going to happen is in any intermediate step in this proof tree the gamma is replaced by gamma with all this psi 1 to psi k. So, the monotonicity of proofs tells me that all these steps do not get affected by doing this. I just added extra assumptions right. So, that is and from essentially from those extra assumptions. So, in all these cases uh, so, let me call let me call this gamma prime. So, essentially I have gamma prime everywhere here throughout the proof and uh, so gamma prime is so, no, so I get this proof tree and this proof tree is valid right ok. But the problem with this proof tree is this proof tree proves only with the assumption psi 1 to psi k yeah. So, uh, so ok now this is all this is for you to read uh, I am going to skip all this because I have explained all this through a proof tree ok. So, now what I am going to do is I take this proof tree and I choose one of them I choose uh, let us say psi k. In this proof tree I can replace a k by a brand new variable z k. So, z k replaces a k. So, I am going to replace this a k. Now, z k is actually a variable yeah. So, so what do we have now? We have essentially a proof tree like this. I am trying to make it look as much like this as possible except that now we have gamma double prime and what is gamma double prime? Gamma double prime is essentially that I, I still have all these is gamma along with uh, these uh, red psi 1 to psi k minus 1 and then now I get uh, essentially a purple psi k proves phi yeah. So, what I did was in this in this proof tree I just replaced all this all occurrences of a k by this variable z k by a brand new variable z k which does not occur anywhere in the proof ok. And I get essentially this proof tree and what do I have? I still have my red constants a 1 to a k minus 1 let us say, but the last one is z k ok. Now, now what I can do is you can see that um, the deduction theorem is directly applicable. Why? Because I have not done any quantification on any of the free variables on the left hand side. Z k is brand new, so I have not done any quantification on Z k. So, which means that now this proof tree can be replaced by essentially by essentially moving psi k to phi. So, the deduction theorem is applicable and I can move psi k out. So, when once I have moved psi k out ok right. So, that is that is this step. So, now since z k is absolutely new yeah is it oh, ok oh. then read the rest of the proof yourself yeah. Uh, 
those who have a class please go I think I want to finish this yeah it, it, it just takes a few steps. Uh, so, the, the, the point is this so psi, now since z k is a brand new variable now I can actually do an universal uh, generalization and quantify universally quantify on z k. So, I get I get this whole thing gamma pri double prime proves for all z k this psi k arrow phi and and since z k does not occur free in does not occur free in phi uh, therefore, uh, I can use that uh, exercise on free variables and this becomes there exists uh, this becomes there exists z k psi k arrow phi right. So, this is so actually uh, it, it, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, I replace z k for, um, for y k. So, I can quantify on y k. So, essentially I get this step there exists y k psi k arrow phi and then I can up I can do this to each of the k's and finally, I will have, I will actually get a proof of gamma proves phi without the use of any of this. So, this is not a translation it is a transformation of the proof tree right. So, essentially now you are free to use uh, the existential elimination axioms uh, rule yeah. ok we will stop here and continue. Mm -hmm.